I'm really interested in the historicity of things. And I, I, I'm concerned that we've made mistakes in this country that are now coming due 40 years late. And um, I'm really concerned with how organic made landfall in America. And, and it doesn't seem to be healthy to me here. In Europe, it's more of a cultural movement. Here, it's more of a financial movement. And, and I, I, I want to start looking at that and thinking, are there ways that we can rethink the dilemma here? I also said earlier, I think this will be the, the last holdout because there's a chance we could be defeated in this country. I do not think that's going to happen in the rest of the world. It will never happen in Europe. Um, if, if Americans think they can defeat farm to fork, you're dreaming. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Dr. Will Brinton. He's a PhD soil scientist and a founder of Woods and Laboratories. We ran the first half of our interview with Will last week, and today, in the second half, You'll hear his thoughts around so-called climate smart programs, like carbon credits for farmers that benefit unproven farming techniques and leave organic farmers out of the conversation simply because they till, even if it's skillfully done. He believes these programs are intentional distractions that allow some of the biggest carbon emitters to continue emitting at disastrous levels. We included Will's point of view in our 2023 Real Organic Project Symposium, which just wrapped up. Tickets are still available to watch the recordings of both sessions, where we discussed the rise of the chemical no-till farming movement and its affiliation with the word regenerative. We also included some innovative organic farmers discussing their experiments with no-till in organic systems. You can find tickets to the recordings at realorganicsymposium.org. Let me let me ask you about another perhaps scientific urban myth. Um, I have heard from a lot of sources, some scientists that you and I both know, um, but also um, advocates both from organic and regenerative, talking about trying to get their their farmland to a fungal dominance. What do you think of that? Does that mean anything? And if it does, is it desirable? Fungally well, dominant soil? The person who originated that, I'm not going to mention names, is a, a forest ecologist, okay? And anybody that studies forests likes a lot of fungi. Um, you're not going to change farmland into fungal dominant systems. Uh, you could drop the pH and lower it and start shifting the bacterial fungal ratios. But I, I, I wrote two papers on this once, um, and very, very concerned about this misimpression that we're being given. It's almost a mechanistic approach to nature, Dave, to say, I can change the ratio of bacteria to fungi. I say, pray tell, how are you going to do that? I've done lots of microbial studies. We used to have a really good microbial unit here, and we did assays where we could identify up to 6,000 different genera of organisms. And most of them were unknowns. They were, they, you could identify them as a, as a separate species, but the database that gave a match to a known name didn't exist. So you would name it yourself and then you'd store it and it would come up again. You say, I wonder who that is. I wonder what group of organisms that is. Um, there's so much diversity in soils, and we did this work largely with compost to try to find out what the speciation of compost was. It was so complicated, we could never nail it, and most of the organisms were unknown. Because the way the world works now is if it's medically significant microorganism, it's going to be classified and it will become known. If it's not medically significant, there's going to be an idealistic researcher somewhere maybe in the world who might elucidate it. 
for some ecological reason. Um, but beyond all that, what I'm trying to say is the idea that you can just go out and shift the indigenous population of a field into a new direction is really just mind-blowing to me. It, the, the population in soil is so resilient. It's been, there's really good science papers on this that your bacterial, fungal, micro and fauna uh, organisms in the soil exist there because the whole nexus of environment, soil type, climate have, as it were, selected for them, not over a year, certainly not over a month or two, but over in the, in the northern hemisphere here where we were glaciated, 10,000 years of development of these indigenous groupings of organisms in your soil. And you're telling me you can go out and do some something and shift that substantially. It just, there's no evidence that it's going to work. And we, we did some studies with compost where we would inoculate compost with an overwhelming quantity, like 10 to the ninth of some foreign bacteria. And then we, we used our microbial plating system to see how long they survive. They, not only did they not take over the system, they perished in like days. <laughs> the indigenous microbes were better adapted to the system than the introduced ones were. Now, really, some of these people aren't saying we're just going to seed the soil with fungal spores. Um, I think they're, they're more, I give them more credit than that. I think what they're saying is we have to change what we're growing. We have to change how we're fertilizing to shift the population. But you will not see a major shift. You will see a little bit of a shift. And I've been following this. I read all the papers on fungal versus bacterial ratios. I've examined the scientific methods that are used for them, and they leave a lot to be desired. A lot of people are using a method now called PLFA, and they think they're identifying fungi and bacteria, and they don't even realize the method is not even looking for organisms. It's looking for phospholipids that somebody in some index somewhere says, oh, there's bacteria with that ratio of phospholipids, and then there's fungi with this ratio. And guess what? They're, they are even shared by plant roots and plant cells, which have phospholipids. So some of these scientific methods are not the be-all and end-all and cannot accurately tell you your fungal bacteria ratios. So how, we, how are they even going to assess it? We don't even have the methodology in the laboratories to accurately assess what we accomplished. And, and you now I would sort of end the discussion there. I just don't think realistically we can make any kind of major shift there. Uh, I mean, yes, some can happen, but no. I thought that's what you'd say. <laughs> We've talked about this, but I, I hear it bandied about so oh. much now. Oh, it's got people absolutely convinced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's such a, it's another one. It, do you want to call it hype? It's such an easy story to say that I can convince you in a minute or less as a lay person, I can convince you that it's significant. Uh, I'm, I, look at the microbiome discussions now today. I mean, it's like, whoa, this discussion has enlarged itself so rapidly, faster than anything we've learned. I mean, we're, we're just playing catch up in the sciences to figure out what, what, what do we even mean by microbiome? You know, what is this? Of course, the word applies to everything, but uh, it's, it's, there's something about modern humans is hype is just number one. Hype is how you raise money for, in capital markets. Hype is how you invite venture capitalists to invest in a company. Hype is how you profess to be saving the future. Um, if we didn't hype, what would the discussion look like? It's very interesting to ask yourself that. And, and I think if we all dedicated ourselves to truthfulness, a lot of this discussion would change. It would, it would just quiet down quite a bit. And the people that are claiming that no-till raises soil carbon, the people are 
saying that organic destroys the soil by tillage, um, they would quiet down quite a bit because they can't back those claims up with any science-based discoveries. Yeah. So we have a situation in which I think billions of dollars are going to be flooding into the, the challenge of climate around agriculture. And I think it's appropriate that we be looking at at the impact of agriculture on climate. I'm fearful that that money will mostly be misspent. In, in, it, it appears in Vilsack's first billion that it's pretty much going to the people who caused the problem. And I'm curious, do you think that this money could be well spent? And if so, how would you, how would you how would you propose to spend it if you were the czar? If you were, you have to be more than the Secretary of Agriculture because he's constrained by a lot of factors. But let's say you were the czar of America and you, you said, you know what, a billion's not enough. Let's put three billion into it. How would you spend that? Certainly, a billion is not enough. It's 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 probably only going to make a tiny dent in the problem. Um, I think it's enormous distraction. From the real issue. The amount, the amount of money, if we could direct the amount of money to be spent to, to reduce like fossil emissions, farming wouldn't have to do anything. Farming could just keep doing what it's doing. And a dollar spent doing that is, is worth hundreds of dollars on the farming side and something else that they could be doing. I am really concerned that this is a big distraction. You could almost say it's a deliberate distraction. Getting all the farmers to believe they have to be carbon farmers now, that they need to change their farming so that we can keep the emissions going. Is that what we're talking about? I, I hear people equating that farmland can sequester the amount of fossil fuel CO2 emissions. Like our duty now, you and me as growers, is to take care of their, their trash. The carbon that they're emitting is their garbage. You know, and it begs the question, um, I have to go back in time to the Nixon era when um, the word recycling was first really invented. It's a very interesting story behind it. A professor Chris Williams has written a whole um, a book around this theme. The, the reason I'm questioning this, this current, what I call a distraction, is when industry announced in the um, late 70s that it wanted to switch to plastic from uh, recyclable-like um, glass objects to plastic objects. This, this was a decision industry had suddenly made in, in that period of time, and there was a huge uproar about what what are you going to do with all the plastic? And the early discussions were, what are you industry going to do when you dump all this plastic on the public? And they said, let us think about that for a while. And they came back and said, let's make it the consumer's problem. Oh, how are you going to do that? Well, invent this idea of recycling that it's your responsibility. And in that one act, they solved their problem. They were no longer responsible for introducing plastic into the world. It was you. You had to do your duty and recycle. If you weren't, you... And there's a whole... St Remember um, the litter bug? That word was invented by an industry trade group to victimize us. They wanted us to feel that we are the cause of the problem. We are the litter box. We're throwing plastic into the landscape plastic that they are producing. Industry, they did not want to take responsibility for it. And they foisted this off on the public and started a recycling movement that you and I feel obligated to do so that they can keep doing what they do. So this is the danger here is that they've just reused this whole strategy on us. Get every little farmer in America hustling to get a little bit of carbon in the soil, knowing that it's hopeless, that Soil carbon sequestration will even dent 
the amount of CO2 emissions. It's hopeless, Dave. I've seen a very good paper saying, are we realistic carbon sequestration? He has calculated, this is a, 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 a geoclimatologist, has calculated we might capture 5% in the best of all worlds. 5% of it. And we're going to do what? We're going to make farmers do what? We're going to, you, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're getting distracted by this. And the distraction, I want to admit, it's a lot of fun too. There's money pouring out of the coffers. There's going to be a lot of interesting projects funded. And there will be some good ideas that come out of this climate smart agricultural funding. Most of it will be silly stuff. Uh, most of it will be people coming up with solutions and then looking for what portion of the problem are we solving here and trying to line it up and make it look good. But I'm so worried this is like that recycling thing that, that industry has invented this to make us feel, to make farmers feel they're responsible for this problem. Okay. Um. You do think that agriculture could be done in a way that would be um, more beneficial for climate. There, there is such a thing as agriculture that is positively bad, and there is perhaps something that is an agriculture that is positively positive. But in, in either case, the positive still is not going to resolve the problem because the agriculture didn't create the problem. It's a much bigger problem than the agriculture can. Did, did I get that right? Well, it's, yeah. Once again, it's one of those things that's, that's so complicated by what we, what we don't know. And um, I spoke earlier about if, if you study climate from a point of view of a tropical rainforest, there's two big things happening. There's emission of CO2, and there's absorption uh, of oxygen at the layer of respiration at the ground level, all decaying plant matter and so on, and the soil decaying. And it is soil decay that causes emissions of CO2. Um, and then stand back and look at the function of the entire canopy. The entire canopy and the layers of plants is absorbing all the CO2 produced in the system. And the other interesting thing they found it's also consuming all its own oxygen produced in the system. So, in other words, all the photosynthetic plants are emitting O2, right? The O2 is necessary to keep the respiration in the system going. The CO2 is necessary to keep the plants going through their photosynthetic cycle. That's climate smart. <laughs> That's an isolated microsystem that is completely balancing the gains and losses. In other words, we have to think of solving this at the local level, at the, at, at, at the individual local level, with increasing the canopy diversity of our farming system so that we have more CO2 capture. And if you and I can say at the end of the day, I captured today all the CO2 my soil produced today, then you have climate smart farming. That's the ultimate solution. But for me to say to you, at the end of the day, have you captured the CO2 that factory down the road produced? And by the way, have you captured the CO2 down there in, in the Gulf of Mexico? I mean, what, is, what does that mean? You know, it, it's, it, it's such a distorted equation. But if every system was like a rainforest with completely balanced canopy exchange of CO2 and oxygen, you, you'd have it you'd have the problem solved. It doesn't solve fossil fuel emissions. That's still a big bear out there. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the sudden, you... sudden release of all this, this carbon that was sequestered a long, long, long time ago. And we're by suddenly- plants. By it's, plants. It's all photosynthetic. That's right. But we're suddenly releasing that. And we're suddenly in, you know, there's some people out there that are really positive, like there's this Canadian scientist, Dr. Smill, who says, we will solve this by innovation. It's going to be accidental. Somebody's just going to hit on something or a combination of things. And he 
goes, takes you back to the history of all the problems this world has created for itself and then solved, and new ones created and then solved. So um, I'm somewhat optimistic that there's just the right combination of things that's going to fix it, no one silver bullet. And that's why, you know, if you say there's a great new world, regenerative, or is there a great new thing, soil sequestration, I say, no, there's not a great new thing. There's going to be multiple things that work. There will be landscapes where we can't balance the amount of CO2 coming out of the soil. I mean, I've looked at high organic matter soil landscapes. The amount of CO2 coming out of the soils naturally is just enormous every day. It's hundreds of pounds of CO2 per day. Coming out of a, like a muck soil. Yes. Yeah. It's just enormous. It's, and if there's no plants there, it's just streaming up into the atmosphere. If there's plants there, it comes out of the soil and the plants are immediately photosynthesizing it and, and fixating it. So, and we're not even studying that cycle right now. I mean, it's known, but no, everybody draws these diagrams of CO2 going to the air and then back to the plant and magically fed into the soil. I criticize that CO2 model that I see. They're not realizing that it's the other way around. The plants are sitting there on top of the soil, filtering the CO2 coming out of the soil. And, and we know now that can be completely balanced. And that's why cover cropping is brilliant, particularly if it's intercropping in a row crop. Because I've seen cornfields, it's bare soil, corn, bare soil, corn. That's your traditional, conventional farming. Plenty of herbicides to keep the weeds down and only the corn plant. But that is a very, um, well, non-diverse system. A lot of CO2 will get out of that system. Um, it's going to get out of the system because there's all this bare soil. It's coming out of the soil. The lower stalks and stems are not photosynthesizing very well, so it can be blown right off the field. We need to rethink our canopy design. Yes. You, you had uh, talked with me earlier in letters about it's not just the CO2 that is coming off of that production system, that there's a lot of toxic chemicals coming off of that as well, and that a no-till system is going to be poisoning the landscape. Leave carbon out of it for a minute. Mm -hmm. But we just talk about glyphosate and nitrogen fertilizer and the things that are going into that. I believe in many ways this whole discussion is another diversion from the real fundamental problems we have. Um, I sat in on some National Academy of Science environmental proceedings earlier in the year, and several scientists revealed that virtually the whole Midwest is, you could almost say it's underwater with nitrate. It's not that it's flooding, but the nitrate levels in the groundwater and the well water are way too high right now, and there's no end in sight. There's this huge moving pool of nitrate accumulating in the system, and it's now being treated as possibly a social disaster because it's hitting rural communities more heavily. And including rural poor communities cannot get nitrate-free water. And it's now showing up on the medical charts in the effects on people. And they're saying this is a really big problem. And this is because of the chemicals leaking out of the system Nobody really wants to talk too much about it because it's, it's such an ugly story and it's pathetic. So the other side of this is the, the no-till side. I went to a special meeting in Ohio uh, before COVID and an ARS scientist gave a talk saying, guess what's causing all the algal blooms in the Great Lakes? I mean, you've heard about these blooms he said it's principally no-till farming that's triggered this. And he w walked us all through what happens to the soil in a no-till system. And again, it's a perfect storm. It, this is complicated. What I'm saying about that area may not apply to another area. But the state is like 80% drainage tile now. Just enormous amount of drainage tiles. And then they introduced no-till. And then suddenly... All this phosphate and nitrate is showing up in the Great Lakes. What's the connection? Well, no-till 
because of the heavy soils in many of these regions, which is why they put in drainage tiles and so on, is causing the soils to crack when they're dry and open up in these cracks. They, they, they did um, images of the profiles go very deep. So when you surface spread fertilizer, particularly phosphorus, it's falling right down these cracks, going all the way down to the drainage tile. And he said, if only these farmers could do a little bit of tillage and break up these huge cracks that are opening up, this wouldn't be such a problem. So that meeting was thunderous because several farmers jumped up and said, we are getting mixed messages. I mean, I remember one farmer, he tipped over his chair and stomped out of the room. He was a no-till farmer and he felt he had been sold on no-till. And then this scientist just says, we have caused a major problem of water quality because of what we're doing. More surface washing, because there's, there's fertilizers being surface spread, um, uh, no tillage, big cracks opening and dry, chemicals falling down into the drainage tiles. How do you solve a problem like that? So it came up in this National Academy of Science meetings, what is the value of the damage caused by the algal blooms, Ohio alone is at $850 million damage in the last three years. That, that is the cost of the remediation necessary to fix that problem. I mean, if you put those two together, that's a, an overwhelming story of concern. Almost, you could almost be outraged by it because nobody saw this coming. And it's not that no-till per se is bad. No-till on heavy soils that can through, go through periodic wetness and then severe dry cycles, that's a calamity right there. And so he was saying we need to look at other areas of the country in which this has happened and start marking these for maybe introducing limited tillage again to stop this from continuing to happen. Um. Pretty big stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's unintended consequences. But let me ask before we, you know, we're get, getting towards. I know you've got a life to get on with, but um, you spent a lot of time in Europe, and um, you're very familiar with the organic agriculture in Europe. I've been kind of riveted by uh, an initiative in the EU called um, Farm to Fork. And it was part of their Green New Deal, which unlike the American one, it actually passed at their parliament. And the farm to fork is kind of the heart of it. And it's got many, many aspects, but two big parts of it. One is to a commitment to increase the percentage of organic land certified as organic. The percentage of European land certified as organic to 25%. And the other is to cut their use of agrochemicals by 50%. Those are revolutionary commitments should they be acted on. And of course, the USDA has reacted to them with basically saying over my dead body. And because both, both countries, both groups are vying for influence in the rest of the world and how their agriculture will be conducted. Have you heard of the Farm to Fork Initiative? And if so, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think it's a, a noble effort or do you think it's misguided? I've been following it from the beginning, particularly watching the backlash in this country over this. And it, what really mostly concerns me is how far this has gone in this country right up into the scientific chains to do work to undermine food to fork concept. And um, two years ago, every year in this country, we have the, the Tri-Society meetings, which is the Agronomy Society, Crop Science Society, Soil Science Society get together. Thousands of scientists pour in. And over a period of a whole week, you have papers on everything, incredible discussions. and. Two years ago, it was led off by a retired USDA official who gave the opening address showing food to, far, 
Farm to fork. Farm to fork as the biggest threat to the development of science and innovation in this country. Leading off a scientific society meeting. I mean, that should be illegal. It's certainly unethical what they did. And he posted slides colored red and blue. Okay, red and blue. And the blue was the farm to fork. I mean, he was politicizing the debate and saying this is, this is going to lead to reduced innovation. This is going to lead to drop in yields. The same old argument we hear about organic, right? And they let this person do the opening speech for a science society. So you want to understand what the problem in this country is. It's gone beyond politics. Now the scientists are buying into this. And that really bothers me. So there's not objectivity anymore. And I wrote letters about this. You know, I got nothing. I felt, and then the CSA News, which all agronomists in America, we all get this journal, they led off with an article opposing farm to fork with the same argument, you know, colorizing it as though it's a political left right sort of debate. And this is just so dangerous. So I think Europe's doing the right thing. There's also a lot of food justice in that component. It's not just, you know, the right thing. It's what is the, what is the social justice angles here? It looks to me like America is going to be the last holdout, the last battleground in all these issues. Regenerative versus organic. Can they swing regenerative far enough that it becomes such a force against organic that it almost paralyzes us? It's not going to happen in Europe. It's too late. They have such a big footprint now with organic land. I mean, the, the lowest country I can find is already 5% of land. That's like Slovenia or something like this. 5%. Austria, 26% right now. Germany is like 9%. Um, when you get that kind of footprint, you're here to stay. And I mean, I'm sort of trying in, in this article I'm writing, I have a little tiny little map here that you can blow up of the distribution of organic worldwide. America is not big on the list. We are in, in terms of dollar value because it's based on retail, but on land area, we're not strong. And our problem is we need more land area and organic so that we have a bigger footprint and we're, and we're going to be invited back to the table. But it's almost, I feel it's almost too late. And England has the same problem. They're as low as America is in the tiny one or so percent footprint of the land that's inorganic. And it really concerns me that we haven't made, um, you know, we haven't made a better landing in the English speaking world. Yes, we're, we're following, not leading. But I'm curious I, I've always puzzled about that. S I think 6% of our food sales are organic and 1% of our land is certified organic. How do we make sense of that? Yeah, I, I, I noticed that recently too. Um, and I, I recently wrote, um, just the other day, I wrote an author at the University of Tasmania that's been publishing all these papers on distribution of organic and different forms of farming around the world. Um, and that they've developed it at a university in England, a new way of mapping by density, density that's different. Just it's not dollar figures. It's density of organic spread around. And these are very interesting maps. Like it shows Australia number one, which is really curious to me. And um, I, I went after him and he just answered me this morning. I said, don't you think this? Australia figures are distorted because they're just certifying these huge empty rangelands. And he said an acre certified is an acre organic, okay? So it's an interesting response to that, but they have such an enormous footprint there that organic is simply considered legitimate. You know, wherever you go in all the political discussions, you can't just ignore it. But this financial discrepancy is very interesting. I mean, I'm, I, would, I was going to ask you the question, what do you think is the explanation that we have such a high retail value, over 40 billion in this country right now, which is about the same as Europe, but Europe has 
has made landfall, as it were, at 5 to 20 percent of the land area in organic, and we're at 1 to 1.2 percent. You know, that's very interesting. Is, is the, the discrepancy of dollars just that there's so much high retail, which is post farm gate value to organic food? Is that what we're talking about? Well, one of the things that I thought, there are two things that I can think of. One is that so much of our organic sales are in really high value crops like tomatoes and berries, which are small acreage for big dollars relatively. And if you were looking at grains or dairy, then you have much greater acreage. So my guess is that the American production is more focused on those intensive crops. We know that I think over half of the certified organic corn in the country is imported. Mm. And we're getting to the point now where a lot of those high value crops are being imported too from Mexico and Bolivia and you know the berries, the tomatoes, the peppers, yeah. the all of that stuff is is moving out of the country. And that would be part of where, well, a lot of our vegetable and produce sales are coming from south of our border uh, for, mm -hmm. for reasons having to do a lot with environmental controls and labor laws, you know, so it's just cheaper to do there. Uh, unfortunate, I mean, I think it's unfortunate because it, it means that the, the workers, we've, we've offshored our worker abuse to some degree. We, we know that the garment industry, for example, you know that you know the the I, I tell this story the a Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City about a hundred years ago mm -hmm. it was a big deal and it was a fire in which many people died because they were in terrible conditions the doors were locked they had to jump out of the windows and they died and the bodies were all lined up on the Lower East Side of New York City and everybody's walking by and the photographers are taking pictures. And that was the real beginning of the American labor movement. And, you know, things like environmental, not environmental protection, but, uh, you know, worker protection laws mm -hmm. came out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, 100 years later, our clothing is dirt cheap because it's being made in Sri Lanka and the workers are treated exactly the same. They're in locked factories. There are fires all the time and they die. But we, the market, no longer read about it. Because we don't know what's happening in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. It's not the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, and I think that as we export production, we export our concern for the lives of the people who actually make the food, the clothing. The food gets cheap. The clothing gets cheap. The thing that doesn't get cheap is our healthcare system. Exactly. And we export chemicals that are no longer allowed to be used here into those regions. So we keep the old system going, but that's only going to last so long. It's going to crumble in those areas too, as people wake up. And China is now the big one to be watching because they're moving rapidly into organic as well. And that's going to be very interesting. They, they are creating a lot of environmental problems for themselves too. And I think they're going to be smarter about solving it because they won't be pushed around by the big corporations. Uh, the big question is, can communism be that smart? And it's it's just, you know, this is what I'm really watching. I'm watching Asia a lot right now, what's going to happen there. Yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of hope for that, actually. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to dig way back into the old-fashioned Confucianism and say, you know what, here's the right way to solve this problem. And uh, that's something that we won't be able to do um, resource-wise. We won't have the culture to do that. And uh, we're trying to solve it through enterprising. And it's going to take some super innovative enterprising to fix this um, climate, yeah. climate problem, yeah. for sure. Well, uh, we'll be breaking this into two parts, this interview. It's, it's all fantastic, and I really thank you. Uh, la last things that you'd like to say the question you wish I'd asked, whatever, anything that you'd like to uh, make sure we touch on before we go? Well, I think we, we really intended to focus, we've talked about a lot of things, but this regenerative thing was something that has really impelled 
us to come together. And I, I think um, you've also spoken recently with Elliot Coleman um, on a similar theme, right? Yes. I can't wait to, to hear that. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the historicity of things. And I, I, I'm concerned that we've made mistakes in this country that are now coming due 40 years late. And um, I'm really concerned with how organic made landfall in America, and, and it doesn't seem to be healthy to me here. In Europe, it's more of a cultural movement. Here, it's more of a financial movement. And, and I, I, I want to start looking at that and thinking, are there ways that we can rethink the dilemma here? I also said earlier, I think this will be the, the last holdout because there's a chance we could be defeated in this country. I do not think that's going to happen in the rest of the world. It will never happen in Europe. Um, if, if Americans think they can defeat farm to fork, you're dreaming, okay? You're going to have to change all the politics of the two dozen countries in the Eurozone, plus convince all the people um, to make that change. So how can America take advantage of that? How can we look at what they've done there? And the other thing is we have to learn to live together in this world with people that are very different from us, which includes free enterprise corporations that happen to believe in a certain kind of farming. And I think we should use the regenerative theme to bring people to the table and say, are we going to be able to coexist? And I think we could go a long way to silencing the unfair critique of organic being wielded by regenerative people of all kinds. I think they're, they're off the mark. I, I, I can find that they're using bad science, even junk science, to fuel the debate. And I think we could be successful silencing most of that. But silence is not suppressing. It's trying to show them it was wrong so they stop doing it. Stop repeating the lies, is what I'm saying. Now, is it possible we could get regenerative to come into the crowd where they accept standards like organic standards? You know, could we have a modified organic farming act that brings them in there, it says, okay? You know, could we say, you're the kindergarten organic and organic certified is high school organic, something like that, because that's, that's actually what I think we're talking about here. We're talking of a form of farming that's got 50 solid years of history, learned a lot from errors that happened, has a wealth of, of social support, huge footprint in most countries of the world, and we're talking of a tiny little movement that could use our help. So maybe, maybe there's something we can do there together. So I'm trying to be optimistic and say, you know, I have to work with these farmers on a daily basis because they send their soils to me. And I'm thinking, what can I say to say we're with you, but you've got to start, you know, help me out here and tell me who told you that and why do you believe that? Because it's not factually true, certainly not scientifically true. And um, what could I do for you to help you better understand this so that we can Imagine teaming up here, regenerative organic, because, hey, the word here is, it's here to stay, right? It's going to be here a long time, that word, just like sustainable is still with us. Um, it doesn't have the same cachet anymore. And, uh, the, but this is here to stay, and we should start working with it. Wonderful. Perfect place to end. Uh, Will Brinton, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, share the link with your friends, and leave us a rating and a review so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. Please join us next time when our guest will be Charlotte Belays, an organic expert and PhD student studying the rise of the regenerative agriculture movement. And please remember that it's not too late to buy a ticket to our 2023 virtual symposium and receive a replay link. You can learn more at realorganicsymposium.org. See you next time.